I'm Stacy and welcome back to my YouTube channel and it's been 5,000 subscribers. I can't believe it. When I started this channel, it was just because I had been thinking about making a YouTube channel for months and I was just like, Stacy, no one is going to watch because no one knows about FPGAs. So who's going to watch a video on FPGAs? So I was just like, okay, I just have to make a video and publish it and no one will watch it. And then I will go on with my life and be like, this whole YouTube thing was a failure. <laughs> and here we are. 5,000 subscri subscribers and two years later. And it seems like there are some people who do want to watch FPGA videos. So thank you all for being part of the 5,000 subscribers. And maybe there's a few of you who are not, in which case... Okay, that's fine. <laughs> so I thought today we would talk about some of the comments that I get on my videos. I also did a post that had questions and I do often see the same kind of comments coming up pretty regularly. So I thought that we would take this opportunity to look at some of the questions that people ask me and we will discuss. Uh, I don't really like feel super comfortable like doing Q&A type videos because it just feels way too much like a real YouTuber and I'm not a real YouTuber. So I just make videos that people watch. So I, I'm, <laughs> I'm not calling this a Q&A. <laughs> we are going to read some of the comments and we're going to talk about them. Are there any cheap beginner kits you can recommend? Because I've got this question so many times. People are always asking me, what is a good beginner board you recommend? And it's always such a difficult question to answer because it just depends on so many variables. It depends on where you are in the world because some vendors aren't going to be available to ship to you. It depends on your budget and it depends on the resources you have available to you to learn about your board. Because there's no point buying a board if you don't have the resources to learn how to use it. So my make a recommendation for anyone, especially someone who is starting out, is to not buy a board. Don't do that as your first step. I should actually make a whole video about this. Don't buy a board as your first step. The first thing you need to be doing is you need to be downloading the tools and writing code and simulating it. You can do all of that with no board in sight. Don't spend money on board. It's free, literally free. Download the tools, get some example code, run simulations. Don't buy a board. Okay, so you've done that. Then you look at buying a board. Then you go, okay, I want to do something in hardware. And I start working on stuff like that. You don't want to do the process the other way around. Then, I mean, then, there, then there's a question. Once you're into the board buying space, there's the question of which vendor. So you can go Xilinx, you can go Altera, you can go uh, Lattice Semiconductor. There's a bunch of smaller ones. My recommendation, and this is just because I'm biased, is just, just to go with Xilinx Vivado. Just get a Xilinx, AMD Xilinx chip because they, Vivado is mainstream and if you're going to be going into industry or you're going to be wanting to do this in a professional way, you're going to need to learn Vivado. I recommend doing it even before you get a board, just download Vivado, mess around with it. Second thing is ex the example code and the example designs are all going to be either Vivado or Cortis. It is tempting to go with your ladder semiconductor because ladder semiconductor is cheap and there are cheap lattice boards out there. From a resources point of view, there's just much fewer resources for ladder semiconductor than there are for other boards that are Xilinx and Intel Altera boards. I almost always end up recommending Digilent. I have been buying FPGA boards from Digilent for years and they've always been really good. HDL Bits is a great option for getting into, I don't remember if HDL bits the system Verilog or VHDL, I think it's Verilog, but this is a great option for not buying a board and just getting into the language. 100% recommend you, you can use a website like HDL bits. There are a couple of other ones out there that I will link below as well that are great resources to be able to. Why is Movado the worst software under the sun? <laughs> so, 
Vivado seems to be kind of controversial in terms of its popularity. <laughs> some people really like it, some people don't. I happen to like it. I happen to be quite experienced with Vivado. And I happen to have used quite a range of FPGA tools, both Vivado and Quartus. And I think that one of the problems with FPGA development, I'm actually going to take my glasses off. One of the problems with FPGA development is that it is a steep learning curve in general. Because these tools are so complicated, the design process is so complicated and the build process is so complicated and there's so many factors that go into designing for FPGAs that it is inherently a complex process to be going through and it's inherently a steep learning curve. So tools aside, FPGA design is complicated and difficult and error prone and takes time to learn. If you take away the FPGA learning curve, I feel like Vivado comes out on top between Vivado and Cortis. So I can't speak for Lattice Semiconductor and their tools because I haven't used those. Editing Stacy here, I just wanted to add something to this answer and say that these tools suck in general. So your Vivado, your Cortis, all of the design tools that are proprietary are going to ask you to register and sign in to download them, have strict weird library requirements, are extremely closed source, make you jump through a lot of hoops to use them, have convoluted documentation. All of this stuff is par for the course. And I recognize that for someone who's coming into this industry, that's really weird. Um, but it is standard in the industry, unfortunately. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I made my YouTube videos. It's, it's just because it's just daunting to install, you know, this crazy complicated software that's 100 gigs big and uses gigs and gigs and gigs of memory. And you don't know what it, it does. So it's, it's understandable. But that, I think, is a factor that people don't realize. Okay. Okay, this is a question that I get a lot. The question is basically, how do I get started learning VHDL or Verilog? Um, this you don't need a board to do. You can, I mentioned earlier HDL, but there are a couple of other websites where you can literally go online and learn Verilog or VHDL. The first initial steps you can, you can do in the tools without having a board. So there is a difference between learning it and then going on to do it, learn it and do it well enough to do it professionally. And I think that a lot of that comes down to not only Verilog and VHDL experience, but also digital electronics knowledge and um, having the foundations for that. So a lot of VHDL and Verilog has a foundational requirement for understanding digital electronic design where you understand the implications of the code that you're writing. You're not just writing code for a processor and understanding the implications of what happens when that code that you write gets synthesized into the FPGA. And that is very, very different from conventional programming. So I recommend, um, doing a course there are a couple of edx digital design courses that go through risk 5 processor design which is kind of a deep end but the first course has no prerequisites so they start from the very beginning and it goes through right through for through a risk 5 processor design and i think it also has like a graphical tool that they use as well so i will link those as well below and that's also a really good opportunity to kind of get more into the digital design side of things because it's one thing to be able to write VHDL and Verilog syntax it's another thing to have the fundamental electrical or digital electronic design understanding can you make a processor design playlist from scratch I am not gonna make a processor design playlist from scratch I, I don't have time to design an entire processor and I am a big believer in not reinventing the wheel. So there is that EDX course that has the processor.
Can you recommend some book on how to begin with decoding raw Ethernet data? I always just use Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> is that funny is that bad i don't know i just find the wikipedia page on raw ethernet and i just use the e i just literally use wikipedia to decode <laughs> you have an error in your overflow check comment instead of it you should be that's perfectly legitimate you're probably right um i wrote that code ages ago so you're probably right what are you using for verilog mode in emacs I find that the one I have, I am using the Verilator Verilog mode, I think. Oh, it's very pool. Sorry, not Verilator, very pool Verilog mode. This one. This one also supports system Verilog and I'm really, really happy with the formatting. I've actually also been using VS Code recently. And when I use VS Code, then I think there are a couple of Verilog plugins, but I use the Verilog, very pool Verilog mode is the one that I've been using. Can you make a video on verification by using UVM methodology? I do not nearly know enough UVM to be teaching it to anyone else. <laughs> that is something that I would personally, let me just turn my microphone down. I think I am quite loud. I would personally need to do that myself. I would personally need to learn a bit more and get a bit better before I am comfortable teaching someone else. I have done some UVM courses and I have written some UVM, but nowhere near enough to claim any kind of mastery over it. Can you cover protocols, various peripheral IPs? That is a good idea. I think I have kind of wanted to but it's difficult to cover comprehensively like a whole bunch of protocols. I've done UART, I've done a UART TX and I've done Ethernet and I've done Axi, uh, which is, I don't know if it's a protocol, it's more like a bus, but it's the same thing. So I think I'm slowly kind of getting my way through some of the major ones. I will post an updated Discord link. I think I did update it. I think the previous one expired. Did you grow up in South Africa? The accent seems familiar. Yes, I did. <laughs> I am South African. That is the other question that has come up a number of times. People have asked me about my accent. I am South African and I grew up in South Africa, in Cape Town. Aside from your hardware engineering background, are you a software developer, programmer, engineer? So my qualification is in electrical engineering. So I'm an electrical engineer by qualification. And for a long time, I specialized in FPGAs. I worked in industry for several years, and then I started freelancing in FPGA design. Um, so my foundation is in FPGA design and electrical engineering. But in addition to that, while I was studying, I also did do several programming courses. So those were more of a foundation for me in programming. And then over the years, I have found that I tend to use programming languages anyway because I end up writing a lot of host site code. So anytime the FPGA is interfacing with the processor, then you end up needing to write the code on the processor as well, whether that's C++ or Python or MATLAB or whatever language that is. So I ended up developing a pretty solid foundation of experience in conventional programming as well. I tend to also do some C++ programming, embedded C++ for Arduino uh, devices and microcontrollers in general, which is a nice break from the FPGA stuff. I notice you have a lot of Verilog content, any VHDL content. The reason why I have Ver Verilog content is because I am most comfortable in Verilog. Well, system Verilog. I haven't written VHDL in quite a few years just because I spend a lot of my professional time in um, US commercial and uh, US commercial is pretty much exclusively Verilog. So um, that's one of the reasons why I'm writing a lot of Verilog and why I write a lot of Verilog for my YouTube channel is it's just the most comfortable language for me at the moment. But I did do VHDL for several years and I probably need to kind of be refresh myself on it. <laughs> I'm a little bit rusty in VHDL. It actually would be a good exercise for me to make some VHDL content just to force myself to de-rust my VHDL. 
Okay, I think that's good. I'm gonna call this done. And I want to say thank you again for 5,000 subscribers. I can't believe it. I never would have imagined when I started my YouTube channel that I would have carried on with it for so long. I kind of expected it to fizzle out. I kind of expected no one to watch any of them and me to like be like, okay, well, this isn't working. <laughs> I wasn't expecting to have it progress and grow the extent that it has. So thanks very much uh, for all your support uh, over the years and I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching.